Our presenter tonight is Dr. Carl Hirschner. He was a professor and director for Center for Coastal Resources Management at VIMS. He was recently retired, but he was with us for 49 years at VIMS, and he will be talking to you about climate change and sea level rise this evening. My plan this evening is to try and cover the materials that uh, some of you may have heard previously about uh, climate change and what we're anticipating here in Virginia. And then specifically to uh, try and answer the challenge that Candace gave me of addressing the relationship between climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic. What we're hoping that I will talk about this evening or get through are these items. Uh, how our climate change forecast develops, what's predicted for Virginia, what's causing sea level rise, the forecast for sea level rise here, areas that are specifically at risk, and perhaps of most, most interest right now with the uh, approaching storm, uh, where can you find information about uh, some of this specific to this area? And last but not least, the uh, COVID-19 and climate change stuff. So let me start with how climate change forecasts are developed. Everyone at this point, I think, is familiar with the idea that uh, greenhouse gases and specifically carbon dioxide have been increasing significantly in recent years. Here you see on the left a, uh, a tracing or a recreation of carbon dioxide levels over the last 800,000 years. And what's notable, of course, is the spike in recent history. Down at the bottom uh, here on the screen, you can see a couple of red arrows. I put those in to remind me that humans really sort of showed up on the earth about 300,000 years ago. We became a notable presence in Europe and elsewhere about 150,000 years ago, and we showed up here in the uh, North American continent probably about eh, 40,000 years ago, 30 to 40,000 years ago. And so our presence obviously is in some way uh, related, at least recently, to this dramatic increase in carbon dioxide, which if you look at the graph on the, the right, you'll notice this is the recent trend and it's pretty much a steady increase blowing through our $300,000, our 300,000 parts per million previous uh, sort of record high, uh, well on our way above 400 parts per million. So this information is used in developing understandings of climate change and particularly climate change forecasts by incorporation in the models that we use to estimate what's happening and what's likely to happen. And the way it's incorporated is through, or has been incorporated, is through what are known as representative concentration pathways. So I got a bunch of people together, they sat down, they estimated what could happen in terms of government policy, human behavior, use of fossil fuels, uh, interest in uh, reducing or mitigating climate change, all of those sorts of uh, uh, items combined to produce a bunch of scenarios from ones where we just conducted business as usual to ones where we all suddenly decided to try and do the very best we could to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Those scenarios, those representative concentration pathways, were then used in a model of the solar insulation, the energy that's coming into the earth. And on the left-hand corner here, you see a, a crude uh, sort of depiction of the radiative forcing that's coming into the earth. Some of it is absorbed in the atmosphere, some of it's reflected back out into space, and some of it, in fact, most of it, or the largest portion of it, is absorbed on the earth's surface. And so what we do with greenhouse gases determines how much is gonna be absorbed into our atmosphere and at the surface, how much is held here on earth instead of being reflected out to uh, the, out to space. That amount controlled by the different amounts of greenhouse gases is what the representative concentration pathways are all about. So depending on how many greenhouse gases one of these pathways or one of these scenarios estimates, we can then predict 
what the likely uh, temperature increases are to be. And on the right-hand side of the, the picture here, you see two of those representative concentration pathways, which end up with two different amounts of energy retained in the Earth, uh, on the Earth's surface, and what the consequent responses of the atmospheric temperature is likely to be. So what's interesting, I guess, if you're really into climate science, is that representative concentration pathways have been used for the last uh, four uh, intergovernmental panel uh, climate change reports, the IPCC reports, and our national climate assessment reports. In the next one, they're going to use this shared socioeconomic pathways, which is, in essence, the same thing, but it represents a rethinking uh, and, uh, an integration of the latest science on socioeconomic and political behavior. And the result is going to be five different sorts of pathways, which we will then convert into greenhouse gas emission estimates, and that would then be converted into temperature consequences. And all of that gets fed into general circulation models. So these are the uh, large computer models which are used to estimate the consequences of temperature retention in the atmosphere, in the oceans, on the land, uh, and how all of that uh, is, one, absorbed from space or absorbed from the sun, and then how it uh, develops the, the patterns at which temperature increases develop across the surface of the Earth. And so for the last decade or two, general circulation models, which are based on physical laws and some direct observations, uh, have been used to estimate what the future is like. So by what's known as hindcasting, using the models to start at some point in the past and see whether or not they accurately predict uh, conditions which we have actually observed. Uh, and then to the extent that they have, using them to forecast what is likely to happen in the future, given one of the scenarios that we were just talking about. So the general circulation models have been used for years. They generally look at the physics of atmospheric uh, processes, ocean conduction and transport of, of heat, uh, some estimate of what goes on in land, and of course they estimate more recently what's happening with sea ice. Those models are no longer the state of the art. Now we're using Earth system models, which incorporate everything the general circulation models had, plus they've added some better understandings of what goes on in the atmosphere and in the ocean in terms of the chemistry that affects um, the, the greenhouse gases, for example, uh, nutrients and other materials, all of which, particularly carbon, all of which affect the uh, temperature of the Earth and the prospects for increased temperatures in the future. These models are the ones that are currently in development. There's a constant effort to assess their performance. This is a quick um, diagram taken from one of the recent ongoing projects to evaluate and compare the performance of these models. Uh, and so what you see here is the, the sort of composite list of all those models that are currently being considered. One other thing that's notable about these models is the increased resolution at which they perform. So the general circulation models, the GCMs that were, start, were used back in the 1990s, uh, early 1990s for the first uh, climate assessment, operated with a resolution of about cells that were about 500 kilometers on a side uh, covering the Earth's surface. At each iteration, as the, uh, we have improved the models and improved the computing capacity to support those models, the resolution, the spatial resolution, has increased. And so currently, the, the last most recent assessment that was done in 2007, uh, the models that were run then had a resolution that was down to about, about 100 kilometers uh, in, in a, uh, a cell. Uh, 100 kilometers on the side. Uh, 
Uh, if you think in terms of Virginia, that meant that Virginia was covered by probably seven cells uh, in the highest resolution models. Uh, at the same time that the, the horizontal resolution was increasing, the vertical resolution was also increasing. So when we started, you know, the atmosphere was divided into like 10 layers and the ocean was basically one layer. It was just a block. Uh, in the most recent iterations of the GCMs, that has increased to about 30 layers uh, in each, uh, both the atmosphere and the ocean. And what happens in the models, of course, is that at each time step, there is an exchange of temperature in particular uh, between cells in all of those layers and horizontally. And so that gets us to an ability to predict out through uh, coming decades, the end of the century, you know, really when you get beyond that, we're sort of guessing, but uh, at least out to the end of the century in terms of what we anticipate to happen based on our best current understanding of the processes in the atmosphere, the oceans, and on land. For most of us that are not doing the, the global climate modeling, uh, but trying instead to focus on, all right, what's that mean to me, and how am I going to respond to it, we would like much more resolved, much finer uh, scale of information that's something that's down to our local levels. Uh, so seven cells across all of Virginia uh, is helpful, but not necessarily the kind of resolution we would like. And so there is a process that has been used in recent years to improve or to translate that information from those large scale global models down to regional uh, information. And that's done with downscaling. There are two types of downscaling. One is done with statistical downscaling, which simply says, well, if conditions in this cell of the global climate model uh, were, you know, temperatures of 20 degrees uh, centigrade, then at this time of the year, that always sort of corresponded to local observations, which were really 17 degrees centigrade. And so the statistical relationship between what was going on in the global model and what we actually observe locally is used then to uh, take the global information and convert it or extrapolate it down to a finer resolution at local scales. There are also versions of downscaling which are based on local models, local models of all of those processes which are observed or contained in the climate, the global climate models. Uh, by running them at local scales, you can arguably get a much finer picture of what's going on. So in any case, with all of that information, we now have an ability to look forward through the next decades to the end of the century uh, and estimate what is likely to be happening as a result of different scenarios of greenhouse gas emissions. And so what we're gonna look at next is what's actually currently predicted for Virginia. And so summarizing, and this is taking the most probable uh, sort of scenarios, which are business as usual scenarios looking forward, the guess, the, the, uh, I shouldn't say guess, the model, the best science is saying that we can expect here in Virginia temperatures to increase between one and four degrees Fahrenheit with an increase in the number of hot days. Certainly we have experienced that in the last month where we have had a run of, what, 30 days straight with over 90 degree temperatures. That's uh, some kind of record in the, the, uh, the long-term records of temperature in this region. We've never had periods quite that uh, hot for that sustained period. The, the things that we know that are related to that prediction. First, the global temperature has been increasing. These are direct observations. Uh, and so you can see this trend line from the 1880s up through the present, which shows an increase of about a degree uh, centigrade or about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, this is averaged over the entire globe. 
you look lo locally at what we've actually observed and what the models predict, here's a, uh, this graph is showing you what the ensemble of models. So remember that first uh, slide or the, one of the first slides where I showed you all the different sorts of global climate model GCMs and Earth Systems models which are now present. And when those are downscaled, you take all the recent downscaling models uh, and take all of their outputs and look at what they're saying for, in this case, Richmond County, Virginia, and what the temperatures are likely to be. That green band that runs across the graph are the highs and lows. It's sort of the range of predictions from all of those models. The green line in the middle is the trend line. Uh, and then the black dots to the left are the things that we've actually observed from 1950 to 2010. And so you can see how well the, the observations uh, match the model predictions, the model's ability to, to predict in hindcasting. Uh, and you should use that sort of understanding, that information to evaluate what's predicted going forward. But clearly the models all agree that there is going to be an increase in the number of days with temperatures above 90 degrees Fahrenheit in Richmond County. One of the other things, you know, we skipped a couple of slides. Um, sorry. So one of, I'm sorry, one of the other, th the implications of this, uh, it's sort of like, well, so what? with increasing temperatures, is that all that bad? Other than I gotta run my air conditioner a lot more. Uh, if you actually look at things like the length of the growing season, so this is of great interest to farmers, gardeners in the area. Uh, and if you can see this graph, it runs from uh, 1893 through about 2013. And the trend lines for both first date and last date of growing season are slowly but surely spreading. And the implication is that in the Chesapeake Bay region, we've seen an increase in uh, the length of the growing season over the last century or more of about a month, a month and a half. Uh, that may be viewed as good if your goal is to produce uh, farm crops. Uh, one of the other things that is predicted by the models, one of the other things that climate modelers anticipate are changes in storm frequency and perhaps intensity. So in the mid-Atlantic region, the prediction for our area is that we will see more storms and we will see them of increasing intensity. The evidence for this, if you look at uh, records of storms going back in this case to 1850 on the left-hand side of the graph up to near the present on the right-hand side of the graph, this is showing you the number of main storms, hurricanes, and major hurricanes each year during that time. So if you look at the average number of storms back in the first 20 years, it was seven. Uh, over here on the right-hand side of the graph, the average number of storms in the 20 years from 1995 to 2015 was 15. Clearly, an increase in the number of named storms that are occurring. The number of major hurricanes, which is of particular interest these days, back in the late 1800s, 1850 to 1870 in this case, there were 11 major hurricanes. There have been 64 in the period between 1995 and 2015. So again, an increase in the intensity of storms that we are seeing. Another change that we're expecting locally is changes in precipitation. So the amount of rainfall is expected to increase in general uh, in our area. And there is a chance or there is a prediction for an increase in intense events. So the evidence for this uh, from the models is here's, here's a model that is looking, this is using the one of the high greenhouse gas emission scenarios. And this is looking at the seasonal patterns uh, of precipitation and how they change from the present, looking out at the end of the century. 
And what you can see here is spring, we're gonna be drier in the south and southwest, we're gonna be wetter in the north and northeast. Uh, I'm sorry, that was, yes. Fall, we're gonna be you know, pretty much the same through much of the country, a little drier in the, in the mid part of the, of the country. Winter is going to be wetter in the north, drier in the south. And summer, we're basically gonna be drier pretty much across the entire country. The interesting thing is when you look at Virginia, so these little circles are highlighting Virginia, and if you're able to focus in on those, the prediction for us isn't that much of a change. There's not a big difference we're anticipating over the course of the century through spring and fall. In winter, we're expecting to be a little bit wetter in this region, but for the rest of the year, it's not a big change from where we are. And in fact, if you look at a model uh, prediction and some of the results for uh, total annual precipitation, in this case for Gloucester County, at least where I'm sitting right now, you can see on this graph that the observations, again, fall generally within the range of values for the ensemble of models that has been used to develop the hindcast and develop the forecast. And if you can look at this trend line or the observed, uh, the mean observed values and mean model predictions, it does increase from what we had back in the 1950s, which was around 45 or so inches of rain per year, to something by the end of the century that's expected to be about 50 inches. So it's a very modest increase in rain but it is uh, an increase in total rainfall. When you look at the amount of, or the number of days where we have really significant precipitation, this is the one that's probably of concern if you're a farmer, if you're, particularly if you're a water quality manager in the Chesapeake Bay. Here I'm looking at Roanoke County. I pick Roanoke because that's an area that's up out of the coastal plain and into the drainage basin, the, the river basin, uh, where we have experienced uh, significant flooding in the past. And what is predicted for Roanoke is an increase in the number of days with significant rainfall events from somewhere around six or so to something you know, more like eight or nine. Uh, that may not seem all that significant, until you start considering what the impact of some of those events have been in our system. So for those of you who've been around as long as I have, Hurricane Agnes was a particularly notable event, not only for the impact on localities uh, at the headwaters up around the fall line, but particularly for what happened in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, in 1999, we had Hurricane Lee come through and Franklin experienced one of what has been a series of devastating economic impacts from floods in the town. And then as recently as uh, 2011, I'm sorry, this was Tropical Storm Lee, um, the rainfall that occurred up in the watershed. So to the west of the western part of Virginia up into Pennsylvania, uh, the amount of runoff from that through particularly agricultural properties brought a load of sediment into the bay, which produced significant impacts on aquatic resources and water quality conditions for more than two years after that. So we've got temperature increases, storm frequency changes, and precipitation changes. And last but not least, of course, we are anticipating sea level rise changes. Uh, as you can see in the note here, the, the models predict that under sort of the scenarios of continued greenhouse gas emissions. We're anticipating about a foot and a half of sea level rise by 2050 and four or more feet by the end of the century. Most of you I'm sure are familiar with this graph of water levels at the Sewell's Point gauge in uh, Hampton Roads. And what shows up here is from about 1927 through the present, the trend line is, the, the linear trend is one for about four and a half millimeters a year increase. So we are, we are clearly and indisputably seeing a rise in sea level in this area. 
if you want to look specifically at observations, recent observations, here's the information from uh, the Sewell's Point gauge, which is actually located in the map on the right, which is the Chesapeake Bay region at the, at the tip of that arrow. That's down in Hampton Roads. That's about where the Sewell's Point gauge sits. And so if you look at the pattern of observations from the Sewell's Point gauge over the last in this case, 50 years, that's the graph you're looking at. Uh, the blue line in the middle is sort of the decadal signal. So it's the, the moving average of what we've had observed and the actual observed um, mean sea level values are the little dots that you see uh, along that line. The, if you analyze all of that information and look at the linear rate of increase. So how much has sea level been coming up every one of those years between, in this case, 2004 and 2019? This is the graph. You can find this information on the VIMS uh, website uh, and the, the address or the URL is down here at the bottom. But there is a uh, sea level rise report card series on the VIMS website. And all of this data and these analyses can be found there. And what you see here is that for 2019, the rate of sea level rise at Sewell's Point was 5.33 millimeters per year. So what's causing this? What's driving sea level rise in Virginia? Well, there are a number of things. Uh, here they are in a quick list. Global sea level is, of course, increasing, and that's a result of warming oceans, melting polar ice caps. Land in this area is sinking. That's a result of isostatic rebound from the last glacial uh, period, as well as local subsidence, largely driven by groundwater withdrawal. And then there is an impact of, as I like to say, the motion of the ocean. So here's the evidence for warming uh, or increases in global uh, sea level with uh, warming waters. This is the uh, sea level height uh, variation from, in this case, back around 1990, uh, derived from satellite observations. And this information led NASA to conclude that the average here over that period of time has been 3.3 millimeters per year. That's how much the global ocean surface has risen over that period of time. That increase has been driven by an increase in the volume of water in the oceans. And that has been caused by two factors. One is warming. So as water warms, it expands. And the evidence for warming of the oceans comes from direct observations. Here's a plot of the world ocean heat content in the top 700 meters, which is the portion of the ocean which is most interacting with the atmosphere and therefore most, uh, most uh, the largest sink for temperature uh, increases in the atmosphere. And so there's a clear trend here in that layer of the ocean. And that observation comes from uh, a bunch of direct observations from NOAA and NASA and one of the things that has been concluded from some, some of the direct observations is that about one third, remember it was 3.3 or 3.1 millimeters per year increase in global ocean uh, surface height. And about one third of that is estimated to be a result of the warming of that top layer in the ocean. So that's the layer that has been expanding, raising our water levels here. Uh, the other two thirds of the increase recently has been driven by melting polar ice caps and glaciers. And what's shown here on the left is the graph of the estimate of losses of uh, mass from the ice cap on top of Antarctica. On the right is Greenland. Uh, I've put the two side by side and sort of adjusted them with uh, red lines running across so that you can see that the scales indicate that Antarctica is really only responsible for about half the amount of uh, fresh water added to our oceans as Greenland. So Greenland 
is currently the hot spot for melting polar ice, or ice cap, uh, and addition of water on to, into the, uh, the world's oceans. Um, the other thing that's often considered, and I just put this in here so I could note it, is land water storage. And that's a, a question of, all right, of all the fresh water supplies that are available to either end up in the oceans or in the atmosphere or on ice caps, uh, what portion of that water is actually stored on land and how does that then relate to what we may be seeing in, in uh, global ocean sea level rise? And this is, this is a, the, the map you see here is a synthesized product of one of NASA's satellites, which is the Gravity Recovery and Climate, uh, what the heck was it, Climate uh, Experiment, which was trying to estimate by sensing fine changes in gravity, um, uh, pull our gravity forces, where water was either increasing or decreasing on the Earth's land masses. And the bottom line is that the, the estimates of this are, are kind of variable uh, and they don't really account for a significant proportion of the change that we may be observing. Uh, when NASA summarized the map that you're looking at, they concluded that there was actually a net uh, decrease in water, or I'm sorry, a net increase in water storage across the Earth's surface and that that would reduce the amount of uh, sea level rise we are seeing. But the numbers, as I said, are pretty variable. The confidence levels are pretty modest at best. Uh, and so I generally don't include this in the estimates we're looking at. So that was the global ocean. Global ocean, we've got warming waters, which are expanding and melting ice caps, which are adding fresh water. The result is an increase in global ocean height, about 3.1 millimeters per year. Here locally, we're seeing water levels rise because not only is the global ocean rising, but we're sinking. And there are a couple of reasons that we're sinking. One is this isostatic glacial rebound. So about 20,000 years ago, when the last ice age was in full swing, there were huge glaciers which were estimated to be a mile or more thick sitting on top of the Laurentian Shield, which is up around the Great Lakes in the northern Pennsylvania and New York. That weight on the crust of the earth, on the tectonic plate that we're part of, pressed down in that region and the result was the area where we are, which I'm showing in this cartoon with a little star, was raised up. So we're floating on the mantle, uh, the, 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 the core of the earth. And so weight on one side results in the tectonic plate bulging where that weight is not present. So we went up uh, at that time. Then as the glaciers melted, the earth that was under them began to rise and we began to sink uh, in balance. And that process is estimated to be continuing today uh, at a rate that is, uh, the estimate is around a millimeter a year. It can count for about a millimeter a year. A number of years ago in the early 70s, uh, there was a team from USGS that went around resurveying land benchmarks, uh, trying to estimate rates of change or amounts of change in the mid-Atlantic region. And this is a map that they produced. It was Hobo and Morrison that uh, did this work. And what you can see here in, this is southeastern Virginia down here. And what you can see is there are two epicenters of most rapid subsidence. So the, the lines you see here are rates of subsidence. Uh, this is per year, millimeters per year. So right here, if you're familiar with our area, uh, this upper, arrow, our upper star is located at West Point and this star is located down in around Franklin in Suffolk. Uh, it turns out that uh, both of those are locations of paper mills, which used to pump, uh, well, they still do in the case of West Point, pump significant, I mean, millions of gallons a day of groundwater from the underlying aquifers in this region. And so 
the rate of subsidence across the entire region has been estimated to be in the one to two millimeters uh, per year. But in these areas, as you can see, it was between three and four millimeters a year. And in the early 2000s, another group from USGS went out and looked at where groundwater pumping uh, was occurring and what the implications or what the impacts were on aquifers. And what you see in this blue overlay is my humble uh, <laughs> synthesis of their rather detailed work as showing the area in which they believe there was a significant reduction in the hydrostatic head uh, created by the underground aquifers. And as you can see, of course, that overlays where Hold on, Morrison saw some of their greatest rates of subsidy. And so a lot of this is coming from pumping from the atomic aquifer. So here's a sort of cartoon depiction of the aquifers underlying coastal plain Virginia from basically the fall line. So imagine Richmond on the left hand side out to the Chesapeake Bay. And the, the vertical scale here is hugely exaggerated. Um, so these are very thin sort of layers of sediment above the bedrock. And we have been willy-nilly pumping from these aquifers for centuries now. And the result is that as the hydraulic head is reduced, the pressure in the aquifer is reduced, the confining clay layers, those brown layers you see on this cartoon, are compressed. And the overlying surface of the earth settles slowly. So uh, that contributes to the rates of apparent sea level rise. So land is going down, uh, one because isostatic glacial rebound and the other because of groundwater withdrawals and local subsidence. That makes the water levels from the global ocean rise seem to be going up even faster. For many years, we thought that the, uh, the Chesapeake Bay impact crater from the meteor that struck the Chesapeake Bay right around Cape Charles, a little off of Cape Charles, uh, some 35 million years ago, fractured the surface of the earth, that that area of impact was slowly but surely compacting after all this time, and that that too might result in uh, a slow subsidence over the overlying uh, sediments that now represent our land surface. The, the geologists at USGS thinking about all this said, you know, after 35 million years, it ought to be pretty much as compacted as it's going to be. So we don't think that's a, a significant contributor to our rates of relative sea level rise. Last but not least, there's the motion of the ocean. So the world's oceans are in constant circulation. What you see here is a cartoon or a diagram of some of the major ocean currents taking, in this case, where you see the orange color. These are warm surface waters flowing, cooling, settling into the oceans and returning down through the depths of the ocean in these deep cold currents, which run around uh, Antarctica, circumpolar uh, transport around Antarctica. Here, we are most interested in what's going on in the North Atlantic, and we're most familiar with the Gulf Stream, which is part of that circulation pattern. So as the Gulf Stream moves past our coast here, on its way up to Greenland, where it chills and settles into the deep ocean as cold, dense water, as it moves north past us, one of the things about a spinning Earth uh, is the appearance of a force which takes moving in this case water, and deflects it to the right. And so the result of the Gulf Stream flowing past our coast is that water along our coast is actually pulled to the east of the Gulf Stream. It piles up out here in the ocean, and there has been a number of studies. Tall Ezzard down at ODU is some of the most recent work. Uh, Abby Salinger, one of the BIMS graduates, who worked for USGS for many years, another one who analyzed this. And what they determined was that the difference in water levels to the east of the Gulf Stream and here along the coast to the west of the Gulf Stream can be as much as a meter, about three feet. 
So the speed at which this, this stream, this current moves is what creates the apparent force. Uh, and as that, that speed increases, the force increases. As the speed decreases, the force decreases. And so one of the things that's notable is that the speed of the Gulf Stream has been decreasing over time recently. And that means that the water that was pulled off our coast out here is now able to sort of slosh back, if you will. The, the pressure that holds it out there is relieved. Uh, and so that may be contributing to some of the water levels we rise we see here. The, the reality is that that uh, set of forces is highly variable over time. So, you know, while the, there is a general long-term trend in decreasing for our speed of the Gulf Stream, uh, the reality is that in any shorter period of time, uh, there can be both increases and decreases. Here's, a, here's an image from NASA of the water temperatures on the surface. Gives you some idea of the actual size, dimensions, and organization of the Gulf Stream as it moves past our coast. The point here is that uh, over a period of a month or several months, we can see increases and decreases as a result of both Gulf Stream uh, fluctuations and wind fluctuations in the region. But over a longer period of time, we think that it may be contributing some to the rise we're seeing here locally. So to put all this together, we're estimating locally that there is a 5.33 millimeter per year rise at Sewell's Point. Uh, global sea level rise is estimated to be 3.1 millimeters of that. You can see what's contributed by ice cap melting, uh, estimate of what's being contributed by the expanding of the uh, water, the ocean's water due to heating. And then land sinking makes up the difference locally with it being anywhere from one to three millimeters a year, about a millimeter being caused by isostatic uh, rebound, and the rest being basically groundwater withdrawal substance due to groundwater withdrawal. So what's forecast here locally? Well, you're familiar with this plot. This is what we've actually seen. Um, and if you take a linear trend through that, it would suggest that over from now until about 2050, we'd probably see about another foot uh, of sea level rise. If you put a quadratic trend through that, which accounts for what we believe, what we actually know from the analysis, is an acceleration of the rate of sea level rise, then we get up to about a little, just under two feet, about a foot and a half or more uh, of sea level rise from uh, somewhere around two, uh, 1995 to the present, or to 2050, I'm sorry. So we're expecting a, a rise of about a foot and a half or more over that period of time. You put some confidence intervals around this, so all those little dots and lines around that blue line were the actual observations, and you can see how variable they are. So if you try to bound the prediction by looking at what's the probability associated with that, you can see that we are anticipating somewhere uh, between one foot and 2.2 feet of sea level rise by 2050. Now, we're not the only one. That, that estimation was done by uh, John Boone, Molly Mitchell, Dave Malmquist, uh, some researchers at VIMS. They put together this analysis, uh, which you can find on the VIMS website. Uh, we're not the only ones who are looking at sea level rise trends, NOAA in particular, uh, has been trying to estimate what's going to happen. This is a uh, depiction of some of their scenarios. Here's the VIMS trend line. Here's the NOAA intermediate trend line. Here's the NOAA intermediate high trend line. So NOAA estimated based on greenhouse gas emission scenarios what was likely to happen uh, with sea level rise. It's notable, the reason I put this up here is this trend line, the intermediate high, is the one that Governor Northam has through an executive order directed the state agencies to use as their planning guidance. Uh, it's also recommended for local governments now. So where are the areas that are at risk? 
The where you can find that is on Adapt Virginia. This is a website, uh, adaptvirginia.org. If you go, this is the page that will come up. If you go to the forecast button, here's what shows up. If you look at the two buttons here, this is the information I've just been showing you, the sea level rise report cards uh, and information about the trends in this area. If you go to the water level viewers, this, and particularly the sea level projection viewer, is where you can get to this map, which over here on the left, you can see there are scenarios for low, intermediate, and extreme sea level rise rates in the region, again, driven by those global climate models. And you can zoom in. I zoom in to Pocosin all the time, just because it's fun to watch the water level uh, come up in Pocosin in these scenarios. Here I've got the intermediate. So this is the the trend we anticipate. Down here at the bottom, you can see a time slider which allows you to move from the present through the end of the century. So here we are in 2020. This is showing you where mean high water is, so the upper edge of the marshes uh, in Pocosin right now. Here it is in 2050, and here's where we think it'll be by the end of the century under that intermediate uh, sea level rise projection. So clearly, uh, sea level is going to be marching across Pocosin, uh, impacting areas that are currently occupied. If you wanted to just for fun look at the extreme sea level rise, uh, this is what it looks like. Basically, if the extreme scenario were to occur, pretty much all of Pocosin would be underwater. You can zoom in on this thing. Here's a, a spot in uh, Gloucester. So you can zoom in to about this level. And what you see are the uh, projections uh, in white here for where the mean high water in a level will be. Again, this is 2020, and here's what it is in 2050 at this particular location. So on that map, you can zoom in, you find the place of interest for you, and you can zoom in. With the approaching storm, uh, I would say it if I remembered how to pronounce it, um, you can also look at what's projected for water levels in the next 36 hours at this Tidewatch map spot. Uh, here I've taken the, I punched that button on the Adapt Virginia site. I've zoomed in. This is the mouth of the York River, uh, the Goodwin Island Marsh Complex. And this is looking at uh, water levels, the predicted water levels. Uh, it goes hour by hour and it looks out 36 hours. Now this was from yesterday's prediction uh, when I downloaded this, but I'm going to step through like the next 10 hours on here. And what you can see or what you can watch is the water level move up and off of the marsh. So the marsh is drying at this point as water tide levels fall. And then as the tide rises, again, you can see the projected uh, flooding there. So you can you can do this on that map. Uh, if you go to the Tidewatch map, you can uh, find the area of interest for you. Uh, and you can see as the storm approaches, you can look out 36 hours uh, from any, any point, any time uh, as that storm's approaching and see what's predicted, uh, what the models predict will be water levels in this area. Uh, here is the approaching storm. So you can see that somewhere Somewhere around Sunday would probably be a good time to start looking uh, at that to see where water levels are likely to be. Last but not least, uh, the COVID-19. So this is, uh, there isn't a whole lot of, of good research about how the pandemic is uh, related or going to affect climate change. Uh, I've got some observations and some implications of those and I'm just gonna rip through these pretty quickly. One, it's clear that as activity levels across the globe were reduced in the pandemic, air pollution was reduced. The, on the left, you can see some images from New Delhi. On the right, you can see some measurements of traffic flows in selected cities. Uh, from my perspective, the important fact here is that it's obvious that it's our activities that are producing a lot of the environmental impacts we see. And so clearly, if we can figure out how to manage those activities uh, we can make a significant difference in the quality of our environment. Another thing that was interesting was this disruption in food supply. So part of it was hoarding, you know, just panic buying. The, the more troubling sort of thing is that to the extent that 
areas closed down, harvest closed down or manufacturing of food supplies shut down because people weren't working, uh, that in a, to some, some degree predicts what we might be seeing if climate change begins to negatively impact our ability to produce food supplies. And so the, the, the failure of production showing up as a scarcity of resources, it was scary enough here, imagine what it is elsewhere across the globe where there is even greater dependence on uh, you know, farm to table, if you will. Uh, we also had problems with transportation, our distribution breaks. So, you know, as shipping and transport closed down, as people didn't go to work, uh, those problems also indicated sort of a lack of resilience in our own food supply uh, mechanisms, processes, which may be uh, aggravated slowly but surely as climate change occurs. Poor health, this is a, a clearly uh, one that you, I hope you've heard a lot about as temperatures increase, health risks increase for large portions of the population. Uh, the pandemic has, in, has, has shown us how those at risk uh, pop portions of the population can be uh, truly negatively impacted. The expectation is that climate impacts will aggravate those conditions as well. Yeah, one that everybody should be familiar with, and this is not just, I just couldn't help putting a picture of Dr. Fauci and Donald Trump uh, up here, but it's globally, if you look at where uh, response to the pandemic has been most effective, it has been in the areas where the uh, cooperation between governments uh, and within countries has been greatest, uh, where we have divisions of uh, perspectives on the issues and divisions on uh, ideas about how to respond, uh, we have been markedly less successful. And then last but not least, one of the things I think, I hope, will come out of the, uh, the pandemic is this sense of the value of science. Um, Bill Gates is uh, noted for having remarked that he has a positive outlook on the implications of the pandemic because he thinks it is showing very dramatically or can show very dramatically and hopefully convincingly that investments in science, maintaining the science infrastructure uh, is what will get you through or find you solutions, help you mitigate the consequences of these events. And so uh, that's all I've got to say. Uh, if there's any time for any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you so much, Dr. Hirschner. Um, while we see if there's any questions to come in, uh, I did have one question. You mentioned that the um, the curvature of the water to the right, so the Coriolis effect, can actually slow. Is that? It's the Gulf Stream. So what happens? Gulf Stream only. Okay. It flows north to Greenland. That's where it normally. It's normally the the warm, salty water, which when it cools becomes very dense. That flows back down the depths of the Atlantic. What's happening as Greenland melts is it's sending large volumes of cool, fresh water out onto the surface of the ocean. And so the rate at which uh, water from the tropics is available or able to get there and be cooled decreases. That slows the movement of the Gulf Stream. That slowing of the Gulf Stream results in a slowing of the uh, Coriolis force or a lessening of the Coriolis force. And that allows the water to sort of slosh back toward our coast. Okay. Uh, so we do have a couple of questions coming in. Uh, what is the role of citizen science in fighting the climate crisis? So when we go out to talk to local officials, state officials, even our federal officials about uh, climate change and the need to address it, one of the things that we have found to be most persuasive is direct observations from citizens. So. I can stand up and show them all the stuff about models that I just showed everybody here, and they generally yawn. Uh, but when one of their constituents says, here's what I'm seeing, and here are the impacts I'm seeing, that is enormously persuasive. And so having people collect that information, those observations, and document it is really important right now. Good to know. We have another question. Was recent Arctic warming an outlier to models? 
So the warming that's going on in Antarctica is largely, yeah, it, the atmospheric warming, yes. The warming that's going on longer term is the ocean water warming, the water that's circulating around Antarctica. And the interesting thing is when you look at what's going on there, there's still a lot of snow falling on Antarctica. Uh, it's accumulating on the land surface. But what's happening that's affecting the oceans is those sort of land-based glaciers, land ice caps, which normally slide slowly but surely into the ocean where they melt, break up, uh, that is accelerating. And it's accelerating because the ice that used to ground on the undersea cliffs and points has been melting away and not reforming every year like it used to. <coughs> Excuse me. And so the result is that ice is able to slide off of Antarctica more rapidly than it has in the past, increasing the input of fresh water in the global oceans. Awesome. How does increasing greenhouse gases in atmosphere affect global temperature? So what greenhouse gases do is they tend to prevent the back radiation of energy that has come from the sun, been absorbed on the land surface, and then normally some of that is radiated back into space. Well, greenhouse gases serve as an effective blanket, if you will, trapping some of that energy on the Earth's in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, and so it that's basically what is helping us, hurting us, uh, by heating us up. There was an interdisciplinary group centered on ODU, Larry Atkinson led several years ago. Did that help our region in any way? Okay, so that, uh, I wish I knew who was listening. So I was a member of that group and the group itself uh, did some pretty interesting work uh, and you know, did a, a good job, I thought, of uh, synthesizing a lot of the information that was available, coming up with some recommendations for actions that could be taken. This was basically focused on the Hampton Roads area and specifically trying to get the Hampton Roads localities uh, synced up with the military in addressing all of this. The problem was that there was uh, no high level commitments to sustaining that activity after the initial sort of funding and effort uh, ended. And so, you know, we did great work for a couple of years and then Gotcha. Um, we have a few more questions. So one is, what is the level of change in the Gulf Stream speed in the last 10 years? Uh, off the top of my head, I'm sorry, I don't remember. Uh, I'd have to go look at Tal Ezer's uh, work. Like I said, it, it's variable. Uh, but it was sufficient enough to uh, capture the attention of the people who are monitoring its movement through the Florida Straits. But uh, I don't know the percentage. Gotcha. Um, are models taking into account methane release from melting permafrost? Uh, currently they are, yeah. The, the latest ones are. Uh, how does rise in sea level and global warming affect sea life, both plants and fish life? So the, uh, let me speak to the Chesapeake Bay. When, you, when, you ri when sea level rises uh, here in the Chesapeake Bay, it does a couple of things. One, it brings in more salt water from the ocean, which at the mouth of the bay is pretty good uh, because that's generally cleaner than what's coming off the land. Uh, but the water depth increasing reduces light penetration to things like submerged aquatic vegetation. And of course, as the water moves up onto the intertidal zone, uh, the real uh, dramatic impact is going to be on drowning of marshes uh, and loss of uh, intertidal wetlands. Yes. Um, all right, so is land substance measured or estimated, i.e. are there projections for how far land will subside by 2050, for instance? So land subsidence is uh, directly measured in at least three ways. One is with what's known as an extensiometer, which is 
They, they drill a well all the way down to bedrock. They anchor a wire in it at bedrock all the way up to the top where it sits on a little uh, measuring device. And so as the pressure or the length of that wire increases and decreases, that can be directly recorded at that spot. It's also done with global positioning systems, which estimate their height uh, by uh, measuring the time that it takes for signals to fly to the constellation of satellites overhead. And over a long enough period of time, that can become very, very accurate. And then last but not least, there's a synthetic aperture radar, uh, which is a either, it can either be plane-based or satellite-based. Satellite's the better way, uh, that can, measure the, the elevation of fixed objects on the ground repeatedly over many, many months to years. And that can be used to estimate rates of change. And so what was the second part of that question? So it's directly observed. And um, are there projections for how far land will subsidize, subside by 2050? No. Uh, I mean, yeah, people guess, but it is nothing but a guess at this point. If you're familiar with the SWIFT project, which is the Hampton Road Sanitation's uh, district's effort to purify wastewater from their sewage treatment plants to better than drinking water quality and inject it back into the groundwater uh, aquifers, uh, that has been, one, it's been demonstrated already, but it's been estimated that that can be uh, result in a significant reduction in the rates of subsidence due to groundwater withdrawal throughout the region. And it may actually, in some local areas, be able to reverse some of it. But knowing exactly to what extent that's likely to happen, I don't, I don't think any responsible geolo geologist has gone there yet. Interesting. Um, so we're running a little bit over, so I'm just going to go with one last question. Um, and then if your question didn't get answered, feel free to email it to programs.vims.edu and we'll try to answer it um, as best as we can. So our last question is, is commercial agriculture connected to sea level rise? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, yes. So commercial agriculture is a source, at least intensive animal uh, production is a source of greenhouse gases. Um, commercial agriculture is probably not uh, significant for, at least the kind of agriculture we have around here, significant for carbon uh, budgets. Uh, in less developed countries, it can be. Uh, rice culture, for example, is a huge source of methane. Uh, so it depends on where in the world you're talking about. But uh, usually we point the finger at farmers for water quality more than climate change right now. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Hirschner. And uh, thank you for taking time out and coming back and giving your last BIMS presentation. So we appreciate it. Before my mental faculties decline. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank, thank you. you. It's been fun. Thank you. Have a great night and enjoy your retirement. Thank you. Thank you.